Hello everyone, this is Kevin Zhao, your finance professor at MTSC. Uh, we are in second week. We just went through chapter 8 and chapter 11, which is about beta estimation, cost of capital, and the growth rate. And that's uh, what, we, what we would cover in the classroom, but outside the classroom, you have two more chapters to cover by yourself. Chapter 9 and the chapter 10, and chapter 9 is about earnings, and chapter 10 is from earnings to cash flows. And uh, I will do the presentation by combining those two chapters together. Before we go through the material, I want you to know that the second week could be very intense. First of all, you have four chapters to cover. Uh, chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, and chapter 11. We already covered chapter 8 and chapter 11. It's time for you to cover those uh, chapter 9 and chapter 10 by yourself. Uh, a lot of chapters to cover this week. A lot of problems to solve for your first exam. By the end of this week, I expect you to complete your first take home exam. There will be 10 questions or questions from end of chapter, even number questions. Uh, here's the thing. Uh, for your first exam, uh, I want you to know that first of all, you need to uh, use Excel spreadsheet to fix all problems. In the Excel spreadsheet, I want you to state the question first, the question from textbook first, and then you work on the uh, solution in those individual Excel uh, Excel uh, Excel spreadsheet. Uh, I want you to differentiate between those input numbers and the solution cell. In the solution cell, I, I will see a number from your solution, but uh, when I click on a cell, I will see a formula. That formula tells me, okay, uh, you are working on that problem, and here's a solution that you provide. And uh, if you only provide numbers, I think uh, it's okay. But in case you get that number wrong, then I, I cannot give you partial credits. Uh, but for formulas, even when you get a number wrong, I see okay that the process that you that you follow to solve the problem, and more or less you will uh, you will miss some number here and there. But I think it's okay. Uh, once you get the formula right, you will get majority of the credit so that's the way that you use for uh, problem solving in your exam there are 10 questions for each exam I don't think uh, you can complete one take home exam in just a couple hours you just cannot do that uh, you probably will spend uh, much more time on those, on those problems and for some challenging problems, you might spend 30, 40, or even 50 minutes solving just one problem. Uh, for easy ones, maybe 3 5 minutes, that, that, that will be sufficient. But, but overall, I expect you to spend a lot of time uh, uh, working on your exam questions. Right? And uh, if you have questions on how to solve a typical uh, problems, uh, you may ask me through sending me an email or ask me during the class. Uh, the other way is to look at illustration chapters. So the illustration tells you how do you uh, the method. Uh, I mean, it show you the method and the, the steps and procedures on how you solve a typical problem. Right, so that's uh, that's homework. Uh, uh, not homework. I will uh, take home exam. And uh, that's uh, another work that you need to complete this week. And the third, uh, the third, uh, third part of the diamond it has something to do with the evaluation project. Once again, you cannot complete your evaluation project in just a couple of days. You have to do this step by step. Each every week, you do part of the work. And during the second week, I expect you guys to get into the detailed information of a company that you're going to analyze. Uh, the information that you need to get for this week would be 10K report and a 10Q report. If you haven't finished reading 10K report last week, then this week we have to uh, look at a 10K report, which is the quarterly report of, I mean, 10Q report, the quote most recent quarterly report of the company. And then a 10K report, the annual report of the last fiscal year of the company. So this week you should cover those two reports. From those two reports, 
you see financial statements, you see uh, management discussion of their business. And I want you to have a complete understanding of what kind of business the company is doing. Uh, what's their most recent uh, challenges, opportunities, uh, what's the most recent numbers for earnings, cash flow, so on and so forth. Right. At this point, I want you to get access to as many uh, information as possible. Another useful source for you to get information is from CapitalIQ.com. MTSU has subscription to CapitalIQ database. And this database has everything that you need. Uh, perhaps more than what you need uh, because once you type in a company name in Capital IQ, once you get access to it, uh, it will show you all relevant information of a company. Right? Uh, all the financial numbers, uh, all the financial statements, earnings, cash flows, estimates, uh, peer comparisons. Uh, market parameters and so forth. So you will get access to everything once you get into this capitaliq.com. So highly recommend you guys to uh, get access to this useful database to assist your financial analysis. So this is a uh, second week. I would say this would be the most intense week that you will experience in this class. Uh, but uh, once you, uh, once you. Uh, once you complete your work success successfully during, during the second week, I would say uh, for the future five weeks, you will have peace of mind because all the chapters that we covered during the first two weeks are extremely important parameters, cash flows, and once you know how to deal with all those things, then later on you will find everything uh, will, will turn very easy. Alright, uh, if you have any questions, let me know, send me email. Uh, visit my uh, visit my office during my office hours. Typically, my office hours are on Tuesdays and Thursdays mornings. Uh, if not, then send me email. I will I will respond uh, respond to your email as quick as I can. And also, you can ask me questions uh, right before the class or after the class. Right. So. Let's take a look at chapter 9 and chapter 10, earnings to cash flows. Chapter 9 is about earnings and chapter 10 is about cash flows. Previously, uh, we, we dealt with, uh, we dealt with discount rates actually. Yeah, just the discount rates. Uh, for equity related cash flow, we use required rate of return or cost of equity, right? Uh, then for, Firm related cash flow, we use a weighted average cost of capital, right? And to get those two discount rates, actually, we went to uh, we we went through a very uh, rigorous work, uh, working on those parameters such as risk free rate or ERP, equity risk premium, beta, growth rate, so on and so forth. But right now, it's time for us to focus on cash flows, right? And uh, this. The discount rates will be used to discount those cash flows in order to get the equity valuation or the target price of a stock. So here are major steps that we need to take to estimating cash flow. First of all, you look at the earnings, earnings of the company, because earnings are source of cash flows. If you are looking at cash flow to the equity, then we needed to look at earnings after interest expense or net income. If you look at cash flow to the firm, then we start with operating earnings after tax. What is operating earnings? That is EBIT. EBIT. Uh, EBIT is earnings before interest and the taxes. Then when you exclude taxes, you are getting the earnings that belong to both shareholders and debt holders. That is uh, operating earnings or operating income. And the second step is to uh, to 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 look at how much the company needed to invest in order to generate future growth. If investment is not expensed. It will be categorized as capital expenditure. 
So uh, here you need to be careful in order to find the capital expenditure of the company in order to generate future growth. And how a company can generate growth? In chapter 11, we learned that a company has to reinvest. And when the when a company doesn't reinvest, the company needs to put a, a, a sufficient amount of funds into capital expenditure as well as working capital investment. So cash flow should equal to net income minus uh, capital expenditure and the investment in the working capital. Uh, if you look at a cash flow to equity, then you, then the last part uh, that you need to consider is the change in debt, which is the difference between debt issued and it, and debt repaid. That is a change in debt. When you're calculating cash flow to equity, so that's a ca cash flow estimation. You go from net income or operating earnings, and you consider net capital expenditure, which is the difference between capital expenditure and deposition and position, then minus change in working capital or the or the reinvestment in the working capital for the new investment projects, and then minus change in debt to get, uh, to get free cash flow to the equity. If not, that is free cash flow to the firm. Okay. Uh, this picture showed you uh, showed you three ways an investor can utilize to measure cash. Three types of cash. The first one is operating uh, income related cash flow. Uh, that's the cash flow that we need to calculate the value of firm. Uh, and the cash here is called free cash flow to firm. Free cash flow to firm equals EBIT earnings before interest. And the taxes times one minus tax rate that is after tax operating income then minus net capital expenditure which is the difference between capital expenditure and depreciation and amortization and you minus change in non cash working capital to get free cash flow to the or FCFF on the right hand side of this picture you see uh, free cash flow to the firm as well as dividend and if you use dividend based model you look uh, you look at dividends and you, you, you treat dividends as only a source of cash but uh, nowadays you really need to combine both dividend and uh, stock buybacks when you use dividend based model because a lot of companies actually do stock uh, repurchase as a way of distributing cash flow back to their shareholders it's an alternative way of paying dividends because when a company does stock repurchases, if investors do not sell their shares, their share price will appreciate, but the investor don't have to pay taxes. And if the company pays dividends, then investors need to pay dividend taxes. So nowadays, more com uh, a lot of more companies are using stock repurchases to, dis re uh, to distribute cash flow back to shareholders just as dividends, just that the uh, stock repurchases has uh, uh, tax benefits. For free cash flow to the equity, that is free cash flow belong to shareholders, that's equal to net income minus net capital expenditure, which is the difference between capital expenditure and deposition and amortization, then minus change in working capital that is uh, additional working capital investment that company need to invest to make their new investment project work and then minus the 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 changing the changing debt which is uh, principal repay minus new debt issues if company pay preferred dividend then you also need to exclude preferred dividends in calculation so this showed you the big pictures uh, regarding how we measure three different types of cash flows. Now let's take a look at cash flow to the firm. A little noisy outside, so let me close the door. Okay. Uh, cash flow to the firm is cash flow belong to shareholders and debt holders. And the starting point for calculation is EBIT, earnings before interest and taxes, 
then you times one minus tax rate to get after tax earnings, uh, operating earnings. Then you exclude net capital expenditure, which is the difference between capital expenditure and the depreciation and amortization. And the depreciation is for tangible assets, and the amortization is for non tangible assets. Then you minus changing working capital to get uh, cash flow to the firm. So that's how you calculate cash flow to the firm. Now, let's uh, take a look at earnings of the company, right? Uh, I mean, no matter you are estimating free cash flow to the firm or free cash flow to the equity, the starting point would be uh, operating earnings. And even when you look at a dividend, the source of dividend would be earnings. So earnings are most important thing that the investors are looking at in addition to those uh, parameters uh, such as the risk free rate, beta, so on and so forth. So earnings. Earnings are really important for investors to look at uh, when they do stock analysis. And this picture showed you how to look at earnings. Look at earnings. And that's uh, that's uh, something that is covered in chapter nine. Chapter nine is about measuring earnings. I mean, you can look at a financial statement, and each every quarter, each every year, company will release their earnings. Uh, that's earnings number that investor will look at. However, uh, keep in mind that that earnings is not the earnings that you need to uh, that you need in estimating cash flow. Why is that? Because that earnings are so-called accounting earnings or reported earnings and what we need in our security analysis is intrinsic earnings intrinsic earnings and this intrinsic earnings can be different from accounting earnings on the right hand side of this picture you see uh, we have two major works to do in order to get that intrinsic earning. The first one is operating lease and the second one is R&D expenses. Those are two commonly, uh, I mean two uh, popular areas that we need to work on in order to do so called earnings and adjustment. Earnings and adjustment is a very important work that analysts need to do on a daily basis in order to find out intrinsic earnings because the reported earnings are not equal to uh, intrinsic earnings right? due to several issues and here two major issues are operating lease and uh, R&D. What is R&D? R is research, D is development and that's pretty common for technology related companies, pharmaceutical companies so on and so forth and operating lease are pretty common uh, for many different types of businesses as well. So, uh, so those are two major issues that we need to deal with, and also we need to pay uh, pay a lot of attention to the cleansing of operating items of uh, financial expenses, capital expenses, and the non recur uh, non recurring expenses. Right. And uh, sometimes. I mean, the company may mix financial expenses with capital expenses. Company may miss and uh, may mix the operating expenses with capital expenses, which means those expenses are not accurately allocated. Uh, uh, how do you say they are not accurately uh, allocated? Uh, here's the thing. Uh, the company report their earnings based on GAAP, U.S. GAAP, U.S. Genuinely Accepted Accounting Principles. Right? So that's a uh, accounting requirement for the company to release their earnings number. But that number actually is not, uh, does not uh, follow the intrinsic value principle. It's accounting reporting principle. Uh, not quite uh, follows the intrinsic value principle, and uh, some, uh, I mean, some expenses. Some, uh, I mean, the money that a company spend during a certain time period uh, is supposed to be treated as investment, long-term investment. However, according to GAAP, it has to be treated as 
periodic expenses, which will be reflected in the income statement rather than the balance sheet. In that case, the company may overestimate its expenses and underestimate its earnings. And underestimate its intrinsic earnings. So we needed to do a lot of adjustment on earnings to to recover the truth of intrinsic earnings. That's one issue. And the second issue is uh, the timing of earnings. And then when investors look at earnings, all those earnings numbers are outdated. Outdated. And the most recent number that you can see is from the most recent thank you report or quarterly report. Uh, let's say we are in uh, we are in April. We're in April, right? And in April, you would say, hey, a lot of companies completed the first quarter of this year. Uh, would I be able to find a uh, thank you report on first quarter of this year? The answer could be yes, could be no, depending on how soon the company revealed their first quarter results. And uh, some company may reveal their results of their first quarter as late as uh, June or May, or May or June. So the the real number that you can get would be the entire year of, uh, of the last fiscal year. So numbers are outdated, outdated, and uh, when you look at earnings numbers from Yahoo Finance or Google Finance, those earnings numbers are pretty old. Uh, let's say we are in year 2000, uh, 2020, April of year 2000, 2020. Uh, what's the earnings of the company? What's the earnings of the company? I mean you. I mean, the best, uh, the best number that you should use would be the estimated earnings for year 2020 and the, the expected or estimated earnings for the next year, 2021. Right? Because for all your equity valuation models, those dividends or cash flows are cash flows for the next time period. It's not the current period, right? It's the next time period. But what we get here is uh, the earnings from the previous, from the previous fiscal year, or previous quarter, or previous year. So, uh, for financial analysts, you need to update information on earnings, to get the most recent earnings, and if you have thank you report, then you should incorporate that thank you report numbers into your earnings estimation. And the trailing 12 months revenue, tra trailing 12 months uh, operating incomes are based on uh, are based on uh, the most recent four quarter earnings and the most recent four quarter revenues. And uh, updating earnings are, uh, are very important, especially for small companies and volatile companies, as well as companies that go through very significant business restructuring because uh, their historical number may not reflect what, we're, what, what you will see in the near future. So accounting earnings are typically unreliable number for you to utilize in your in your valuation, and uh, you probably wanted to discover the truth of intrinsic intrinsic earnings. So why accounting earnings are not reliable? Because the gap U.S. gap U.S. generally accepted accounting principle allows U.S. corporations to have financial expenses mixed in operating expenses. And also the same gap allows, I mean allows, legally allows company to have capital expenses mixed with operating expenses. Now here are two major examples. The first one is operating lease. And operating lease are also called off balance sheet item. Typically, let's say an airline company wanted to buy a new uh, a, 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 a new uh, Boeing 737 MAX. And most companies do not buy this directly from Boeing company. And most company, most airline company will actually lease this airplane from a leasing company. They don't buy it, they, they actually rent, <laughs> rent a, an airplane from the leasing company. So periodically they pay, uh, they pay lease expense on the airplane. And they put that expense in the income statement in calculating net income. So that is operating lease. Another example would be a restaurant. When restaurant rent 
places they pay lease uh, on their places and uh, they put lease expense into the income statement as well however this operating lease actually represents a long-term commitment that the company needs to fulfill in the future in nature it's no longer like a renting something it's more like they 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 they, they purchase they purchase that a large amount of assets and uh, they pay interest periodically that's a financing expense and when they when they are using that assets the depreciation and position need to be calculated as the operating expense part of that asset. So, uh, so when when this lease operating lease uh, stays as a so-called off-balance sheet item, uh, I mean it's supposed to be like assets and the liabilities stayed on the balance sheet, but it's not. It's only be treated as expense. So what we needed to do is to recover the nature, I mean to recover the nature of this leasing expense. Typically, uh, we, we put, uh, we calculate total value of this operating lease. That would be the total value of the debt the company would carry. And then we add back the operating assets on the left hand side of balance sheet. Uh, and uh, the operating lease liability on the right hand side of the balance sheet right, to complete the full picture of the balance sheet and on the income statement income statement uh, this operating lease actually mis, uh, mispresent the expense of the leasing assets and we needed to find out what's the true leasing assets expense for the uh, uh, I mean for the certain time period so that's the adjustment that we needed to do for this leasing expense when we are converting accounting earnings to intrinsic earnings. And the second example is a uh, company by, by this gap uh, is allowed to mix capital expense with operating expense. And sometimes they are forced to uh, mix capital expense with operating expense. I mean operating expense will only benefit the company during the uh, during the given year, but the capital expense is money that a company spend that will benefit the company for years to come, like uh, fixed assets, long term assets. That's capital expense, but the operating expense is more like a salary, uh, the utility payment, which only will benefit the company periodically. So uh, when you look at R and D, uh, R and D expenses research and development expenses uh, the gap actually only allow company to report R&D in their income statement now, all the R&D should be treated as expenses the current time period expenses however when you look at the nature of R&D R&D is the money that the company spend this year however the outcome from R&D will benefit the company in years to come. So R&D in nature is a, a long-term asset, long-term investment, but treated as expense. So we needed to do capitalizing. We need to do capitalizing as part of this earnings adjustment. And we needed to recover the nature that R&D is a long-term asset. And only the amortization of R&D is the expense for the current time period. So uh, we have two major is issues to deal with: uh, trying to recover the nature, uh, recover the truth of intrinsic earning. In this picture, you see magnitude operating lease is tremendous for uh, for certain businesses such as the restaurants, furniture stores. And the percentage of operating lease as percentage of operating income could be as high as, high as 50%, and on average is more than 10%. But all those operating lease are treated as off balance sheet items. So it's a it's a very important item, and it's very common, and uh, the magnitude is pretty uh, significant. On average, is more than 10%. Therefore, we have to do this operating lease. Treatment uh, when we do earning adjustment. 
Let's look at how do we deal with operating least expense. Operating least expense are treated as operating expenses uh, in the income statement. However, it should be treated as financing expenses. So here's a major step that we needed to do to deal with operating lease. First of all, we needed to calculate the debt value of operating lease. I mean, instead of viewing company leasing assets, you would say, hey, the company is borrowing money from the leasing company to buy that assets, and periodically they pay interest. So that's the nature of operating lease. And uh, when you, I mean, the debt value of operating lease should equal to the present value of operating lease commitment at the pre-tax cost of debt. I mean, the discount rate is cost of debt, and then the value of the debt equals present value of all lease payments that the company needs to commit in future years in a given operating lease contract. Once you convert operating lease into debt, you also need to create an asset item to counter it uh, on your balance sheet. So your ba on your balance sheet, you will have on the left, you will add operating lease assets. On the right, that is operating lease liability. And those two items should have the same value. So you see, your balance sheet sh shall be expanded a little bit by adding this operating lease assets and the liabilities. And the second, uh, second step is to adjust operating earnings. And the operating earnings, before you do any adjustment, actually, actually it's not accurate. So you add, uh, so you adjust the operating earnings equals previous operating earnings plus operating lease expense. Lease expense, you add that expense back, and then you minus the true cost of this operating lease asset, which is depreciation, uh, depreciation or amortization on the operating lease assets. Or you can use another equation, which uh, show you that adjusted operating earnings equals operating earnings plus pre-tax cost of debt times present value of the operating lease. You can you can use uh, both uh, either one of them, but the first one is more accurate. Let's take a look at one example to see how we deal with operating lease before we can uh, conclude this video. Uh, gap. Uh, the gap has conventional debt about 1.97 billion dollars on its balance sheet and pre-tax cost of debt is about 6%. Cost of debt is 6%. Uh, its operating payment in year 2003 were 978 million US dollars and its commitment for the future is uh, below. Okay, uh, it makes sense because Gap actually need to uh, rent a lot of spaces for their local stores. Uh, they have seven year uh, lease agreements with landlords across the country. And uh, for the first year, they, uh, they needed to pay, for the next year, they need to pay $899 million. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, I mean, in the second year, $846 on suppose. So you see. Uh, lease payments for the next seven years, and then you apply six percent as discount rate to calculate the present value of those future lease payments, and you add them up together, add them up together to get that value of the lease, which is equal to 4.4 billion US dollars. That's also the value of lease assets. So you put this number on both size of your balance sheet uh, on asset side and uh, and and the liability side so on the asset side you have 4.4 uh, billion US dollar more uh, which is this leasing assets on the liability side you have 4.4 billion more debt as the long term debt right. so previously the company i mean on the balance sheet they have 1.97 million dollar worth of debt but after the adjustment, you see the debt, the, the true debt they are carrying is actually 6.4 billion US dollars. Tremendous increase after the adjustment. In the second step, we look at adjusted operating income. The stated income was 1.012 million uh, billion US dollars. Then you add the Lease payment in year 2003, 978, 
and then you minus the depreciation on this lease assets. I mean, total lease assets is 4.4 billion US dollars, and assuming that the lifespan of this asset is seven years, and we use straight line depreciation method. So the annual depreciation would be 4.4 billion divided by seven, divided by seven. And when you uh, when you come at all three numbers together, you will get a 1.38 uh, 1.36 uh, billion US dollars uh, compared to 1.012 billion previously reported earnings and actually your intrinsic earnings uh, is, is more than 30% higher than your initially reported accounting earnings. And this table showed you the tremendous impact of operating lease adjustment on um, um, this uh, company's uh, financial reporting. It affects uh, income statement tremendously, the balance sheet, as well as cost of capital. I mean, in this case, you see that in the income statement, previously the earnings are one. Uh, uh, about one billion dollars, but after the, the adjustment, it goes up to 1.36 billion US dollars. So your operating earnings increase by uh, more than 35 percent in this case, which is a very, a very significant and a pretty tremendous. And on the balance sheet, you also see the balance sheet structure changed a lot because previously the total debt is only a little less than two billion US dollars, but right now. After the adjustment, it increased to 6.36 billion US dollars. I mean, the debt increased tremendously. So, in, since debt increased tremendously, then when you calculate cost of capital, or uh, then, 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 uh, if you use a, uh, 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 if you use accounting numbers, then you will make. Uh, then you will commit pretty serious mistake because you may underestimate or overestimate cost of capital because your debt number is not correct, right? Your earnings number is not correct, your debt number is correct, then how you can get a correct number on cost of capital. So here, uh, the the cost of capital, uh, the cost of capital previously was calculated as 7.31%, but after uh, after you you do this leasing. Uh, leasing assets adjustment, the cost of capital actually declined to 6.25%. Tremendous decline from 7.3% to 6.25%. That is tremendous. You say, hey, uh, it's just a 1%, but look, this 1% will be used to discount all future cash flow. It's tremendous. 1% out of 7.3% will generate tremendous. Difference in valuation, and also return capital. Previously, you thought it's, uh, it's about 13 percent, but right now, after this leasing assets, leasing uh, operating lease adjustment, I go down to 9.3 percent. So from this table, you see, hey, I have to look at the operating lease and do the operating lease adjustment when I do stock valuation because the impact is huge. Alright, so that concludes this video and in the next video I will give you more details on how to deal with uh, research and development expenses which is equally important, equally uh, equally significant when you do equity valuation. Alright, uh, I hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you in the next one. Thank you so very much. This is Kevin Zhao, your professor at KSU. I'm here to help you. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to visit my office or send me an 